Namaskar friends, welcome back to this next lecture in the series for the course on engineering psychology. The last few lectures I explained to you the capabilities and limitations of both the visual system and the auditory system. The human visual system and the human auditory system are the two main sense organs which humans use for interacting with the world around them. I briefly also explained how tactile and olfactory sensory organs can be used for presenting warnings, alarms and displaying information. The first two lectures were about introducing engineering psychology, the subject matter and the nature of it and then discussing research methodology which can be used for designing and testing various system operator interactions. Now, in today's lecture, and the one which follows, I will be discussing the methods of evaluation which is used in engineering psychology. Now, given that we understood the physiological limitations capabilities of the human sense organ, how do we evaluate a system which is designed based on knowledge gained from understanding these sense organs. The subject matter of today's lecture is focused around this point. We will look at how user centered design is used, how information is collected from the end user and analyzed what are the methods of collecting information from the end user of any system, how do we develop those methods which help us in collecting information from operators and users of a system. We will look at how to test the usability of a system and we will also test whether the usability principle works those techniques which are used for measuring usability. So, this is a summary of what is going to happen in the next two lectures. I will open up today's lecture with a scenario which is common in everyday interactions of people with systems. Now, most of us book our tickets through an online website and we are so familiar with this whole booking ticket paradigm that by using it a few times we have become champions in it. So, we know how to select a ticket, how to pay the money and get the reservation. So, assuming that you are going from place A to B and for some reason you do not get a direct connection which leads you to think about ways of how to go from point A to B. One option is to take a break journey somewhere and then make your ticket in such a way that booking it is cost effective for you and the booking experience itself is good. So, you head to the website where you have been booking your tickets up till now and you try to understand how this break journey kind of situation fits into your booking. You log in and put your password the same way that you have been doing up till now. You put in your departure station and the arrival station but now there is a problem. You know there is no direct flight from your departure to the arrival station. So, how do you make sure 
where your brake journey should be so that it is cost effective, time effective and does not involve you in thinking too much. Nowadays system are equipped with this kind of intelligence which suggests you so many ways of booking this ticket. But assuming that I am thinking of a system prior to what has happened now. So, now you want to look at how to do this. You have not used this feature before, but you know that this is available in the website. So, you try various combinations by your knowledge about the midway between point A to B and try to book the ticket. Now, when you want this journey to be cost effective, a number of factors would be at play. For example, certain sectors are used too often and the flights would be cheap. Certain connections are available more than certain other connections. Certain sectors have a time period during which they give you tickets of lower prices and these kind of information are not available to you. So, you by your knowledge you start booking a ticket and after you book the ticket by applying your own knowledge and some help from the website, you end up buying a more expensive ticket. Now, suppose you tell this to your friend who explains to you how this can be done with a single click and there are hidden menu features which you never thought of exploring because it was not intuitive. But after learning you realize that these features could have been well used and because you were not aware of this feature and the website itself was not too helpful in providing you this information upfront, you ended up paying more and wasting more time in getting this booking. The problem I just described is a everyday feature. Often you have seen websites doing improvements, products and systems upgrading themselves and these upgrades are so non-intuitive that the user has no idea how to interact with them. From the designer point of view, these upgrades are very helpful to the user. But it comes to the user, the user finds these upgrades really difficult to handle and sometimes these upgrades even lower the user's performance and hinders with his effectiveness of completing the task at hand. So, what should be done here? One solution to this problem is using the user centered design wherein the end users are brought in and they are involved in each testing of the product cycle. And once this is done where the end users are involved with the experts in the field of which the product is trying to make an selling, the websites can be designed in an intuitive way so that the end user gains a lot from this redesign. This section is going to cover exactly this scenario where we look at why design evaluation should be done, what is a user centered design, what are the ways of collecting data in a user centered design, how is this data analyzed and then further how do we test the evaluation by usability testing methods? So, let us then begin our journey. Now, why is it important to evaluate methods of engineering psychology? The importance lies in the fact that by using various designs and evaluative methods, we collect information about the user's initial requirement. One of the primary scope 
of making a improvement in a design is that the earlier design was not addressing the user requirement. This could also be true for newer products which promise to help the user in ways in which the earlier products were failing. Also by using these evaluative methods we can get sure that with the first testing of the product or the system the user does not get lost. When the product or the system is launched for the first time we do not see a too many complaints about it. Now for better understanding the end users needs and capabilities and creating designs in such a way that they reduce errors and problems on the side of the user we need to evaluate the improvements in design. So, the importance of testing designs lies not only in terms of collecting information knowing about users requirement, but also seeing how designs help people in committing lesser and lesser errors and getting into serious problems. Evaluation methods in design help designers in understanding human interaction in systems and products. Designers are always hungry to know how people interact with systems. Most designs are intuitive, but are people understanding the mental model or the idea behind the making of the new design or product? If there is a closer match between the idea of why the product was made and how the product was made and how the users are perceiving this, the design turns out to be better. If there is a gap between this, then problems arises. So, one of the reasons for doing this evaluation is understanding how human interact with systems and products. Now, when designing a new system, developers may want to interview and observe users first to better understand their work function and needs. All designs and product upgrades and system modifications are done to help the user. But to do this, we should know what the user is in actual requirement of, how the user is actually functioning and what is it that they require to be improved and what is it that they require to be left the way it is. So, this kind of knowledge is an important part of evaluation method. So, how do we collect data requiring user requirement and understanding the work function and the work profile of the end user? Two methods are generally used for collecting data and that is the survey and the questionnaire. Now, in a way the survey and the questionnaires are more or less the same and these survey questionnaires have a purpose to gather information if it is an exploratory survey or get an answer to a specific question if it is a specific survey about a particular applied problem. So, I design a new system which was not there before. I might want to know who will use the system, how is the system going to benefit, the kind of target user that I have thought will use the system. And so, in this kind of a situation, the survey will be more exploratory in nature. On the other hand, if I have a specific system functioning, but I find out is that there is one stage or one process in the functioning of the system which confuses user, I might use specific questionnaire to find what is confusing the user and how to address this problem. So, the design becomes intuitive and the systems become more helpful. 
A good example would be using the camera on your cell phone. So, should I be using portrait? Should I be using general photography? What kind of aperture site should I use? Should I use it with flash or not? The width of the photograph. Now, with a fixed automatic sensing system, these kind of questions can be handled. But then information should be available as to what difference will different modes bring in terms of capturing the same photograph, a small kind of a preview. And this kind of questionnaire could be a specific questionnaire. On the other hand, I want to launch a temperature sensor on a phone. Now, I do not know whether users are going to use it or not. And so, for that purpose, I can use a generic survey to know whether users will first of all use it or not and if they will, then how many times do they use it? Is it important? Because a lot of cost will go into adding this feature. So, this is how surveys are designed. The next step in evaluation is usability testing. So, given that the developer and designers have understood how people interact with the system and also understood the work profile of people who are using the system and what their needs are. And based on that, they have collected data using either questionnaires or surveys. The next important thing is to include this into new design and do something called usability testing. In usability testing, actually individuals who work in the environment are made to use the product or the modification in the product and data is gathered while people are actually using the product. Now, by doing this, by bringing in users who use a product in all phases of the development of the design, I will be able to address both known and unknown problems that might occur when I introduce the new modification in the design and this would save money and effort on the part of developers and designers. So, how do we evaluate and collect data? There are three ways of doing it. We use qualitative methods of interview, questionnaire and survey or do usability testing. And by using any of this method, when we get the data, we analyze the data using different approaches. We can use descriptive or inferential statistics and we can use different kinds of designs to test this data. So, we talked about something called the user centered design and we understood the meaning of user centered design is using the actual end user in the development process of a system or product. Let us look at some more details about user centered design. So, why are they used? User centered design are used to avoid problems and frustrations the, practic the practitioners employ when they are doing design iteration. It translates to the fact that whenever a new iteration of a design is made, designers and developers gets frustrated at some points of time in the design process. They have to assume a lot, they have to assume how the end user will think about this design and what kind of responses they would do. But by using a user centered design where the actual users are brought in and tested at every phase of the development, these frustrations and thinking on behalf of the end user would end 
because now we have real users to tell us what problems can arise. User centered design is the practice of involving end users in the product design process from the beginning. So, right from the conception of the design itself to going to the drawing board to developing the mental model of the design to implementing the design in prototypes to testing the prototypes and then the final launch of the product using end users in all of these phases is what user centered design is all about. The user centered design stresses users need and requirements to understand how users work with existing system before new systems are designed. We have looked at this point before also. So, what user centered design is focused on is finding out how people are actually interacting with older systems and where is the problem and what can be done to overcome this problem or what kind of modification in the system should be done so that the problem does not come at all. In the first lecture itself, I explained to you how IO psychology that is industrial organization psychology would get rid of this problem. The industrial psychologists would train people to use and make benefit from the handicap of the system, but engineering psychology would employ modifying the system so that the users do not have to be trained in something which they are not well, well versed of. Engineering psychology would focus more on the capabilities of the user and try to modify the system in such a way that better interactions happen between the operator and the system. User centered designs document users needs and requirement by using observation survey and interview. Three methods of collecting data by using an observation, by using a survey or by using an interview. In observation, subjects are monitored in the real environment and the person who is observing does not interfere. In a survey, questions are put to people who are end users of a system or a product and information gathered from them in an interview a one to one interaction happens between the end users and developers. One benefit of using user centered design is called participatory design. Participatory means that the end users participate in the process of development and modifications of the system or the product. Now, participatory design help developers gather explicit knowledge and tacit knowledge of individuals. Explicit knowledge in terms of what they think and how they interact with the system. Explicit is what is consciously seen, what can be seen. So, developers while seeing how users interact with systems can gather information as how they are interacting with systems. Tacit knowledge are those hidden knowledges which each individual has in his mind, but explicitly he cannot reproduce that knowledge. One good example is riding a bicycle. Now, most of us can ride a bicycle, but if you ask people who ride a bicycle to write a step by step process for teaching bicycle riding, it becomes really difficult. Bicycle riding is a procedural knowledge which is a motor memory and it is somewhat difficult to explain in terms of words. 
So, techit knowledge are also those knowledges which end users employ while interacting with systems, but they do not know how to describe this. For example, people while operating machines through their intuition or through some other calcul mental calculations, no combinations of button to push to avoid a certain situation. If you ask these operators why did they do this, they would have no answer to why did they do this, but by practice or by experience or by some other met, uh, mental knowledge which are not conscious, they learn this paradigm. So, this kind of information of how users are using non-conscious form of knowledge to deal with certain situations can also be evident in participatory design. Because in participatory design you have the real users working in front of you and so if designers do not understand how a certain task was done by a end user, they can probe questions as to what really happened. Now, explicit knowledge are exploratory knowledge and they can be easily articulated. Techit knowledge as I explained to you involves information about habits and processes one knows but cannot talk about. We just discussed this in terms of techit knowledge, those non-conscious forms of knowledge are studied which help users in performing a certain task, but the user has no awareness so as to why they are using it and how did this knowledge in the first place got into their mind. Now, most participatory designs have three stages. The first stage of a participatory design is the initial exploration of the work. In this, the designers observe what the users are doing with the system. The designers do not interfere with the work of the end user and the main motive of this step is to gather as much knowledge as possible through observation, how the users are interacting with the system and what kind of mental model they have. The mental model part will be studied in more detail in the second stage, but here too by observing the user, the experts and designers and developers can have some idea of what is happening. So, in the initial exploration of work, observers observe users in work environment to understand how they do their job and how they work with other users and systems. So, not only with their own system, but how a cooperative work is done, this knowledge can be gained from the first step. The second step is called the meetup. In the first step, the designers and developers have observed how the users interact with systems and other people who work in same or complementary systems. In the meetup, designers meet users of a system and try to understand the workflow and the process diagram of how a system really works. So, assuming a power plant, if I want to redesign something in a power plant, a certain section or a certain process, the first step would be to go there and see how people are working in a power plant, observe what steps they are doing right from entering in where the machines are started to the final point where power is generated. Once I have this information through observation, designers will sit with power operators and ask them how this 
whole business of generating power goes about. And there are high chances that what you observe and what they explain, there will be a difference. So, this second stage is important to know what designers want in terms of how people interact with systems and what kind of mental model or what kind of mental strategy is used by end users in accomplishing the job. Now, once the two stages are complete, the third stage of prototyping comes in, wherein the designers through their observation data and through the workflow and mental model data create newer designs and design modifications into the existing system. For example, in our power plant experiment, a system design or a user interface design which is modified will now be presented to the user and they are asked to work with it. So, a mock up of the new design will be made and real users will be asked to interact with this mock up. This mock up is called the prototype, it is not the actual system, but kind of representative of the system and then users feedback as well as their performance on this newer system are observed, so as to know whether the improvement that the developers were targeting is actually helping the end user or not. So, in rapid prototyping, both designers and users work together to create prototype mockups, both electronically and in paper. And after this, a new system design is developed based on the joint understanding from exploration and meetup stages. So, prototyping is an extension of observation data gathered from step 1 and meetup data, interaction data that is gathered in step 2. So, we looked at how user centered design should work and how user centered designs help us in designing new modifications in existing system. So, that it is both usable and efficient. Now, we looked at methods of collecting data and in this section we will understand two popular methods which are used for collecting data from people. One method that I am going to discuss now is called the interview. Now, most of you viewers out there understand what is an interview. But let me do a brief review of what an interview is and how it can be used for gathering data and what is the use of this data. So, interviews are generally one on one discussions with end users and they provide flexible methods of gathering a large amount of information from fewer individuals. Mainly interviews are one to one. So, there is a respondent and there is a observer or an interviewer. The interviewer asks the question and the respondent answers. So, this is a one to one kind of a thing. When you approach for a job, you are supposed to enter an interview. In an interview, you will be put questions to sometimes through a panel and sometimes one to one. When a panel interviews you, it is called a focus group or panel discussion, panel interview. But generally speaking, most interviews have one to one interaction. Interviews are flexible as in a variety of data can be collected from it. You can collect both relevant data and non-relevant data related to a question and a large amount of data can be collected from few individuals. Generally interview a question is put to you and you are supposed to answer. Your answers are taped and recorded 
and then meaning ex is extracted from your answers. If the interviewer does not understand some answer that you have given or a part of answer that you have given, he can ask a probe question and through that he can probe and try and understand in more detail something which you explained in the interview and something which he did not understand. Now, generally an interview has one interviewer and one respondent, we have already understood that. If we have more than one respondent at any point of time or more than one interviewer at any point of time, the interview becomes a focus group. So, one primary difference between a focus group and an interview is an interview is a one to one interaction between a respondent and an interviewer, but a focus group is a many to one interaction between either multiple interviewers and one respondent, one interviewer and multiple respondents or multiple interviewer and multiple respondents. These multiple interviewer and respondent should not be large. A focus group is a small collection of people who are called in for a specific purpose. We will look at focus group in few minutes after this time and there we will discuss what is a focus group. So, ahead in the lecture we will look at focus group. Now, how is an interview done? An interview can be done face to face. So, one interviewer and one respondent talks and they sit facing each other or it can be a telephonic interview in which a call is given to you and an interview talks to you like those surveys, interviews which telephone companies or other service industry people employ for collecting data and other technologies like there could be video interview. So, a number of methods can be used for doing interviews. Interviews generally fall in three different types. We have a structured interview, we have a semi structured interview and then we have a unstructured interview. In a structured interview, a predefined set of questions are put to people and they have to answer these questions. The way they answer these questions is recorded and the responses are also recorded and analyzed. One control that should be used in a structured interview is that respondents should answer specifically to those questions which have been put to them and they should not deviate tangentially from the subject matter at hand. So, if I ask you a question, how do you perform a power cycle in a particular product or a system, answer should be related to the steps which are necessary for doing a power cycle, but not related to why the power cycle is performed or whether there is a need for this power cycle or not those kind of questions will not be entertained and answers related to that will also not be entertained. So, specific answers to specific questions. In a semi structured interview just like the structured interview we began by pre -sp uh, specified questions. So, define power cycle and when you define the power cycle of a system, if the interviewer feels he can probe the end user or the operator for more information. While defining a power cycle, you define the down phase of a power cycle and the way you define is something which the interviewer finds interesting. He finds that there may be some kind of knowledge that 
is not inbuilt in the design of the system and he wants to use your knowledge into redesigning this system for making it more efficient and intuitive. With these purposes, the interviewer will probe onto the down cycle and will ask you questions related to why you perform certain actions in a down cycle which is deviating from what is in the manual and other related questions and the information that they get from that will be helpful in designing better systems. The next kind of interview is called an unstructured interview which has no predefined questions. It is like define how you work or define your work profile. Now, in unstructured interview, people can write all kind of answers. There is no limitation and there is no guidance as to what is to be written and what should be the capacity. Respondents and interviewer discusses area where researcher guides but allow unique responses. In these certain areas of interest is discussed between the interviewer and the respondent. But answers cannot go again haywire, although varied kind of answers are tolerated. But if answers are too different and too vague, they are uh, a probe is done or a guidance is done so that these vague answers are eliminated and the vagueness can be handled. So, those vague answers, how to make them less vague or whether to not record these vague answers, that kind of help is given by the interviewer. So, some kind of control is administered in unstructured interview. But unstructured interviews are the best form of interview because it gives you a lot of knowledge which are generally not available in structured and semi-structured interviews. So, the purpose of an unstructured interview is to decide which interview method to use. If you want exploratory data, an unstructured interview is the best. But if you want limited and structured data, you should be using a structured interview. Unstructured interview provides large data and is comparatively easy, but data analysis is difficult. So, you get a lot of data about a lot of things and why it is easy is because a little guidance is needed and questions are in open ended format. So, it is easy for the user to give in a answer, but analysis of these answers becomes difficult. Many reasons can exist, your answers could be very vague. Your answers could be such that it is out of context, your answers have some clue or some information related to a non-related phenomena and which is not part of the question and so analysis of data becomes difficult in an unstructured interview. Now, free form of the unstructured interview lacks consistency with no direct comparison of response. Now, since you enter into a unstructured interview, you can give all kind of answers. So, two people who are in an unstructured interview for the same question can give different answers. For example, define your happiness index, define your satisfaction and two people will have different measures of satisfaction. So, they may give different answers. So, it will be very difficult to measure consistency between these people and direct comparisons is not possible. For one person, satisfaction could be all about earning money and for the other person, satisfaction could be all about finishing the job. So, a direct comparison cannot be made because the meaning of satisfaction changes from people to people. And so, since the unstructured interview is a free form and the question was define satisfaction, 
comparisons across people would be difficult. One possible way of handling data from an unstructured interview is using content analysis. Now, in content analysis, the raw answers are first categorized according to themes. A good understanding of the content analysis can be developed by the thematic apperception test, which is used in personality. What is done is the answers are first taken and some primary measures like word frequency, word occurrence, word uh, usage are collected. Once this is done, each answer from each user is read and an underlying meaning or theme is generated. Theme re refers to what one sentence or a section of sentence actually mean. So, there are some themes which are pre-given in terms of satisfaction from the interviewer side and the theme which is emerging from the answers are taken and evaluated against this. Now, if you read answers which people give, different people will more or less agree on certain themes and that is the basis of content analysis. Somebody would write my satisfaction depends upon how much work I do, the number of hours I come here and the number of jobs that I do, the number of machines I handle it gives me enjoyment and that kind of a thing. And the underlying theme here is the work satisfaction. So, this kind of themes are developed and answers are put under this theme and a comparison is done. This kind of analysis is called the content analysis. Analyzing the content of those statements which have been written in an interview. Now, when is a unstructured interview very helpful? It is very helpful in those cases where new situations arise and parameters are not set. So, there is a new system or a new product and we do not know how to measure the effectiveness of this product. In those cases, unstructured interviews are done as an exploratory interview because the user while interacting with this new product may give developers hint as to what could be one possible or many possible reasons for using this product. And they may also give you those additional thoughts which developers can use in advertising their product. So, newer products and new situations which do not have a dependent variable to be measured, the dependent variable can be extracted from the responses given in an unstructured interview. And semi structured interview for them we should use categorical data because categorical data is the best kind of data for a semi structured interview. We can put in questions and since these questions are predetermined, people can first answer the questions in terms of different categories. And once you select a category, a probe question can be asked as to why did you select this category and what are the reasons for selecting this category. So, categorical data is the best for a semi structured interview. One way of deciding which interview technique should be used depends on the population under examination. If you are using a larger population and issues which affect larger population, then unstructured interviews are good. But if the population is such that it is fractured, a stratified 
then maybe a semi structured interview is the best. So, the kind of population that we think of addressing and the kind of problems of the population define what kind of interview are we going to use. Now, most interviews employ a lot of questions and different formats of questions. Two different formats of questions which are used in all of these interviews are called open ended questions and close ended questions. So, what are open ended questions? Open ended questions are those questions where a subject can answer the way he wants. How good do you feel after this new product or how do you evaluate this new modification of the system? These kind of questions are open ended questions and then end user can write any answer that they want. They can define one feature more elaborately and they can focus on one feature and they can not, uh, they may not touch another feature and this kind of knowledge will help the interviewee to understand whether the thought process they had in developing these modification whether it is properly understood by the people who are the end users. So, these are open ended questions and it can have any kind of response. Close ended questions are those questions where selected answers among limited options. Now, if I am doing a part of the system, if I am improving a part of the system, an example could be I can replace a multiple choice question with a yes no question or if I want to replace a particular section of a test with some other section of a test. Here I do not want vague answers, here I do not want those answers which are open ended. I want very specific answers which should relate to whether the system modification or the test modification that I have done using a drop box instead of a mouse choice is better. How does it work? And in those cases, I use close end questions. So, as I just described before, if Google wants to know whether the 5 point scale or the 5 star which was used earlier to rate a video, if that was effective or whether the thumbs up and thumbs down that you have right now on the YouTube section of Google, whether that is effective. It can use the core close ended questions as in how do you see this change, whether this change from a 5 star to the thumbs up and thumbs down, whether this is easier for you to understand, whether this is more intuitive to you. So, when I am looking at specific problems, a open a close ended questionnaire is much better than an open ended questionnaire. Now, there are other methods of collecting data there could be focus groups, there could be questionnaires and there is also a discussion on usability testing. We will cover these portions in the next lecture. So, till we move, uh, meet again in the next lecture, it is Namaskar and thank you from the MOOC studio. Mm -hmm.